everything started with the new architecture called Transformer from 2017 by Google researchers. They introduced this new architecture for analyzing textual data and language data. And then they introduced new architectures called GPT in 2018. And then all of a sudden in 2020 and 2022, OpenAI introduced GPT-3 and 3.5 and then ChatGPT and start to take over all this business. And even you can't even keep up GPT-4 after less than six months it's introduced. So this is a kind of a timeline how it started. This new version of large language model started from transformer architecture. It has been in the world before, but it wasn't as widespread and successful as we see. Hi, I'm Cray with the International Water Training Institute. On behalf of the Australian Water School, I wanted to welcome you to today's webinar, but I ran out of time preparing for it. Uh, my kids have been telling me nobody needs to do their own homework anymore with all of this new tech out there. So I'll enlist a bit of help here and see how we do. So today's webinar on AI for the water sector. Welcome to our webinar on AI for the water sector today. We will explore the ways in which artificial intelligence is revolutionizing the way we manage and protect our water resources, blah, blah, blah. Join us as we hear from experts in the field and discuss the potential of AI to transform the way we approach water management and conservation. So a bit, uh, bit scary. Am I in fear for my job? I don't know. But first of all, before we bring on some presenters and panelists who are gonna help answer those questions, let's take a look at this phenomenal map today. Tremendous response. 3,000 people have registered for this. I've, I'm going to make the claim here that this is the biggest concurrent uh, gathering of water professionals anywhere on the planet ever. Prove me wrong. Check the chat bots and see if they can prove me wrong with that. Now, there are some legitimate fears here. Looking at this map here, people have submitted almost 200 questions, many of which express some apprehension about what uh, AI means for the future. And these chat, chat bots, large language models, we'll hear about that today. But rest assured, the large language models tell us they are not trying to take our jobs. Then again, again, as we look at some of these things and look at the coverage of where this might go, there are some people out there wanting to put a pause on AI. And there are some legitimate fears out there of where this might head in the future. Luckily, the uh, chatbots have uh, assured us that uh, we have nothing to be afraid of. We can trust them. But again, that's what uh, they would say if they ended up taking over. So I just wanted to kind of uh, introduce that, that those uh, apprehensions, rest assured, the machines have told us we are just fine. So with that, again, welcome to all of you out there. If you have some apprehensions about this, if you have some uncertainty about where this is heading, uh, I hope you'll see today that we are having some, there will be some tremendous uh, opportunities for the, uh, the water industry. Today's experts, if you can turn your cameras on, Cobra, Chris, Hans, a few of you have been with us before, Chris and Hans uh, on previous webinars. Cobra, first appearance here. If you could just introduce yourself uh, briefly and just let us know a little bit about yourself and where you're coming to us from and uh, how long you've been in the AI business. Thanks, Craig. I have my PhD in the field of AI actually 10 years ago. It seems a little bit old now. Then I started working in the field of artificial intelligence applied in several application domains. But my main interest has been so far in the healthcare. But I see that there are a lot of similarities between different topics. So yes, that's the short history about me. That I have over ten years now working in the field of AI. Excellent. All right. Um, I've only recently been exposed to it. Um, Chris, uh, over to you. Can you let us know a little bit about how long uh, you've been interested in AI and um, LLMs? Well. Thank you, Craig. I am uh, a 20 year veteran in hydraulic modeling. Uh, my expertise is in HECRAS modeling, but I'm very much a novice in AI and learning how to use chat GPT like I think a lot of you are. I'm here to ask questions because I have a lot of them. I have ideas. I have thoughts about it. And uh, one thing I have learned is you can ask chat GPT a lot of this stuff. So, <laughs> But I'm going to see what the experts here say. Excellent. Okay. And over to you, Hans. Hi, great. Thanks. Welcome, everybody. So I'm Hans van der Krost. I work for IHC Delft Institute for Water Education. I'm an associate professor of uh, open science and digital innovation. And also in that function, I'm also interested in all these new developments. 
I'm an active member of the QGIS community, and we have this uh, new plugin, which I'm going to demonstrate to you in a, in a bit on how to use QChat GPT in, um, in QGIS. But also, I'm, I'm very much interested in what are uh, also the, um, the things to take care of when you use tools like ChatGPT. It's, of course, a great, uh, great tool, but there are also uh, things we need to take into account while using it. And also, my students are using it more and more in good and bad ways. So <laughs> I'd like to uh, discuss with you also about that. Thanks. Excellent. Okay. In the background, we have got Clemens Kramer, Richard Crowder, and Benjamin Coos, who are going to be joining us for a special panel uh, in the second half of our presentation today for software developers. Now, we'll hear from Cobra a little bit of an introduction about what all this means with an overview of some of these terms and abbreviations and acronyms that you might have heard of. You know, that's something that uh, we want to make sure you're familiar with. So we might be backing up a little bit for some of you who are already familiar with this, but we want to start from the beginning and make sure that everybody it gets a good exposure to this, even if you've come to this for the first time. Now, let's see from the poll results, who is coming to us uh, for the first time? Have you used an LLM like ChatGPT? Well, look at this. 75% of the people have not used it. So I'd encourage you, give it a shot today. Watch what we do today and try it yourself. So that gives us a good feel for how we start this. And it looks like of those who have used some, uh, ChatGPT is the overwhelming lead, but I'm sure some of these other ones will be taking over uh, shortly uh, in terms of overall use. Most people expect AI to affect things positively. So those fears maybe that uh, some people have expressed, maybe they're unbased. Uh, let's find out a little more about that today. A lot of people here are involved in water modeling. So we've got almost half of the community here that's joined us today involved in water modeling. So that's good because we have taken one part of the water sector uh, modeling and focused on that, there are many, many other applications that you'll see momentarily. Now, there are some dangers in this. This is from a webinar we did on rating curves a while back. I pulled up these pictures and automatically, without me even asking, it decided what these images were. A person riding an elephant in the water there, and this person here, a red fire hydrant uh, covered in snow. Um, so you can see if we're relying on these kind of artificial intelligence, if they need to test my humanity with trying to identify a crosswalk or traffic light, which I have to do on a lot of websites. Uh, if it has trouble identifying those, how are we letting it drive cars? Uh, if it can't identify the difference between an elephant and uh, uh, somebody uh, taking uh, rating curve measurements. Those are the kind of questions we want to ask today. Uh, in the background, um, we're going to provide you some resources here um, on this website. I've got hydroschool.org slash AI, where I've got these forms um, that uh, many people have filled out, along with some entertaining answers to some of the questions, putting things in different styles. It's kind of fun to do. We might try that at the very end here. Some legitimate questions that we might ask it, but most important, some of these background resources. If you uh, if we run out of time today and we haven't been able to respond to things, there are lots of these background resources, including a previous webinar we did uh, about a year and a half ago, um, where we talked about informatics and um, AI in water resources and some of the cool applications there. So go back and watch that one. It's free, and uh, you do get professional development hours for this one. So let's upskill here. First question that I'll ask then, and turn it over to Cobra. I wanted to do something water related here. So out on the internet, you might see a couple of imperative statements like one that says, we all live in a yellow submarine. So I'll take that as a example, water related question. 100,000 times out there, Google says, there's a statement that says, we all live in a yellow submarine. Does chat GPT know that that's false? There's a few statements that say we don't. Well, yes, it can go in here and figure out that it's just a song. So in reality, Submarines are specialized vessels. They're not intended for long-term habitation. Only a few people can live in them. And some people may choose to live in a submersible vessel for a short time, but it's not common. So we can conclusively say, we do not all live in a yellow submarine. Now, my question for Cobra, if you want to start sharing your screen. I asked it a question. It thought about it somehow. There are hallucinations. There are weird things that it does. Speaking of the Beatles, we'll hear about hallucinations today from the machines. What happened in the background? How does it know this? What's going on here? I'm brand new I, to ChatGPT. I just loaded it a month ago when Chris mentioned this idea to me. I, I'm here to learn, just like Chris. I've got some questions. So over to you. I can see your screen just fine. Great. Thanks for the great intro. So I'm going to just you know, start with what is AI, because all of these large language models and, and uh, similar stuff goes back to this question. What is artificial intelligence, or in short, AI? 
So a lot of this comes from, uh, yes, this example that you showed and a little bit on this hype that we get from these movies that we saw. And some of them are actually close to reality nowadays. And all of this goes to general AI. Uh, so when we have general AI, we should have some, some, something called narrow AI as well. By general AI, we are trying to approach human intelligence in general aspects. So they are not just good at one task, but they are generally good at many tasks. But when we talk about narrow AI, which is very typical uh, actions nowadays, is about AI is good at, you can make it good at one thing. But going a little bit deeper into what is uh, AI is actually drilled down to data. Uh, it wasn't before possible, but it's now much more close to reality because we have access to different types of data, tabular data in forms of different databases, image, and so forth. So if I want to, to draw what is AI, it's a lot. But today I'm gonna narrow it down to machine learning. And from machine learning, in short, I would call it ML, is about, what is it about? It versus traditional programming, which is still out there, so traditional programming, it is about you have data and you instruct it how to produce output for you. Like a calculator, you know what you're after and you program it the way you want it to be. But machine learning is actually, you are relying a lot on the machine to learn and draw conclusions be between the input that you have and the output you desire. And you expect the machine to learn that interaction or relationship between the input and the output. And then you can rely a lot on this machine learning uh, approaches. And very large amount of uh, economic value out there by AI is actually through mappings between this input to the output. And I call input X and output Y. And technically we call this type of AI or machine learning supervised machine learning. So what is supervised machine learning? When, when I say supervised, there should be unsupervised as well, which I don't focus on today. But supervised machine learning is when you have your input and some labels attached to your input. I provide some very sim simple example that I have some images of cats and dogs. And per each image, I already have the correct ground truth label, cat and dog. And then I throw this to the machine. And in, when I say machine, I am referring to it nowadays is algorithm. This algorithm try to understand what are the characteristics of cats and dogs by itself without me telling directly the cat is defined as this and this and this. So it needs to understand the common characteristics between dogs versus cats. When it's trained enough, then I expose them the algorithm with this new image that is, there's no label to it. And I expect them, the algorithm to predict it correctly, which of course, it will have some errors, but we expect it to have a good uh, accuracy of performance. So this is basically very simple definition of supervised machine learning. Back to my definition of machine learning, which was a simple function, simply a function that try to map between X and Y. And you can of course now define what should be the X and what should be the Y. It can be a camera picture that you try to, to map it to if that's to you when you are opening your a laptop or your mobile with your image. It can be camera images and your output is the objects in that, which is very similar uh, example that Cray also showed, like in this object detection for autonomous driving. It can be translation. So now I am trying to dive in a little bit on text. So if I want to go through draw from AI to ML, and then ML, there, there is a subset called deep learning. I don't want to teach deep learning here, but I just want to draw, uh, to, to prepare you a little bit, what is deep learning? So everything starts with artificial neurons, 
back in the 80s, where mathematicians and computer scientists try to uh, mimic the human neuron with some mathematical calculations, and they call it artificial neuron. It has some ups and downs, but now we have deep layers of artificial neurons, and it's much more deeper than this image that I'm trying to show. So it has billions of neurons in these new models that you see in the world. And so it's basically mathematical calculations, calculating, uh, so multiplying much matrices layer by layer until you have the output, the desired output. So this comes to this deep learning. And now today we have something called large language models. So back to this image that I tried to show, AI and then machine learning and then deep learning. And we have something called natural language processing, which is about processing the human language. And the marriage of deep learning and natural language processing is large language models, these new things that you see in the world. But large language models are not really that new. They belong to over 50 years ago. But the new generations that are really, you know, you see them sometimes beating over human in some question answering, they are belonging to this new generation that is the marriage of deep learning and natural language processing. And if I want to go to this new generation, it's not that old. It started, everything started with the new architecture called transformer. And I put the transformer just as you remember, the transformer image. It's nothing to do with that transformer movie. But this architecture that I tried to copy from their paper from 2017 by Google researchers, they introduced this new architecture for analyzing textual data and language data. And then they introduced uh, new architectures called GPT in 2018. And then all of a sudden in 2020 and 2022, OpenAI introduced GPT-3 and 3.5 and then ChatGPT and start to take over all this business. And even you can't even keep up GPT-4 after less than six months, it's introduced. So this is the kind of a timeline, how it started. This new version of large language model started from transformer architecture. It has been in the world before, but it wasn't as you know, widespread and successful as the VC. But how they are trained? Basically, they are trained all over the internet and all over the digital files that you have access to internet or sometimes even local data. And then what does it mean when we train large language models? Basically, they train it on these two ways, which we probably use it at school level for our kids also. So two main tasks is they try to push the model to learn the next sentence prediction. And they provide enough examples that what is the correct next answer and what is the red one that I showed is the wrong next answer, next sentence prediction. And also they try to teach the model by masking or uh, removing some part of the text, like the bottom example. It can be sometimes one word removed or multiple word removed, and they push the model to learn this. So you see, they are trying to create some labels from the data by itself and push the model to learn these relationships. And relying a lot on this fact that we have a lot of text. And then eventually, after showing it billions of like these examples, it will learn these correlations between text. And then you can, technically it's called fine tuning. You can fine tune it for your own task, which we call it downstream task. So for the first step is like, when you train a human uh, about language, and then you can fine tune it for your downstream task. There are different ways of fine tuning, but it's basically nowadays it's called prompt engineering. What is a prompt? A prompt is simply a piece of text that you formulate it as a mask language problem. And then it's an art actually that nowadays to write this prompt so you can tune the large language model to produce the output as you wish. So I provide some examples of these prompts. Uh, you see the prompt and I try to put some colors because of the context. Uh, the first thing you provide in the prompt is the context. So this example is about movie review classifier. And then basically you can provide no examples. So 
but uh, you can ask the mother to generate it in the way you want. So what's a lovely movie? And the review is, and you don't provide an answer for it. And you expect the model to, pro to generate positive for you. And this is called zero shot. So I don't provide any examples. Zero shot learning means that I don't have any examples. But you can also provide one example, which is called one shot learning. So I provide already one example and then ask the model to generate the next one for me. And it can call few shot then if you provide few examples. And the length of the prompt, how big that prompt can be, it depends on, of course, many uh, details of the large language models. But you don't expect the model to, to produce what you want, but you can provide examples so it can tune its output for you. Because large language models coming from the generative AI, they generate for you the text that you wish, as you wish. And not a surprise that, yes, some jobs are being to disappear, but new jobs actually started to appear. Nowadays, it's called prompt engineers. And yeah, you can find more examples. And it's not limited to text. Nowadays, they start to commercialize a lot of video and image generation based on the text that we provide for them. Uh, but back to the question, how to use these LLMs? Uh, there are, if I want to categorize, there are three ways to use these large language models. Either you go for these commercial large language models, chat GPT and similar ones, and then you, of course, buy from them some APIs so you can uh, do prompt engineering to tune it for your own task. This is the first and probably fastest, more accurate in terms of the, of course, the amount of text that it was exposed to large language models, commercial one is much more accurate than the ones that I trained myself. But the second uh, approach is that you use open source LLMs. So you can have access to the open source, you can download them and then do the same thing, prompt engineering. It's not as accurate as the first one in terms because, because of the open source aspect and of course the um, how large we are talking about, the, about computational resources. And the last one is about, yeah, I trade it from scratch. I don't trust neither of these because they are trained on uh, both good and you know not reliable text. So I want to train it from scratch. Yes, you can do that, but you should remember a few things. Uh, so the, the things that need to be considered here before I wrap up this uh, talk is about generally these large language models are trained on the whole you know digital, uh, internet uh, files. So it can include bias because we are, we human are biased. Uh, it can be biased towards many things and it can include non-reliable text as well. There are issues around safety, privacy, and security. There are issues around accuracy as I talked and there are like millions of examples over internet where these large language models were generating just you know, nonsense when you ask the question. They're getting better and better, but still the, re the main reason behind this is two things I can uh, behind these three first things I, I listed in the top rectangle. The first thing is that these are our train on what we as human have been writing over years. So this includes a lot of uh, bias text, a lot of inaccurate information, and it's not easy to separate them from accurate ones. And these large language models need a lot of data. And when we say a lot of data, I'm talking about billions of records if you want to have a good model. The second thing is that they are generating, they're generating text by mixing this and generating text. So these are the two facts we shouldn't forget. And if you wanted to use the open uh, uh, commercial ones, you shouldn't forget that some of these are banned in some countries nowadays, and they are actually starting to ban it because of many reasons. And if you want to train your own or rely a lot on these open ones, the bottom rectangle is applied to you because they require a lot of power and they require large training data. I have an example from the country I'm located in Sweden. They try to train a large language model to based on the Nordic languages, mainly Swedish. The biggest or the most powerful computer they could find in Sweden 
it was limited to some billions of parameters they could train. So it's it's a fact that you, you need to have large computational powers if you want to train it. And of course, large training data. So these are the points to consider. And with this, I want to uh, wrap my talk around the very short intro to AI, machine learning, and then dive into large language models. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. I think that's going to be very valuable to have available and probably to rewatch for a lot of people here. So with that, uh, thanks for that introduction. Cobra's going to go into the background and answer questions on the chat line. Chris, uh, I can see your screen just fine. Uh, let's hear some of the questions that you might have for our panel coming up. That's right, Cray. I have questions. Uh, I'm a water modeler. Uh, I'm not a chat GPT or an AI expert by any stretch, but I'm learning how to use it. And uh, I've got questions. So I'm going to go through and, and just um, put some thoughts together, ask some questions, um, kind of pass along what I've learned so far, and, uh, and then we can continue on with the discussion. Um, in the spirit of what we're talking about today, I thought I'd put a disclaimer on here that ChatGPT was used in the preparation of this presentation. Um, so what is what is this all about? What are we, why are we here? Why do we care about ChatGPT and AI? Well, I think there are three things that we're all trying to strive for. We're trying to get more efficient in how we work, produce better products and reduce uncertainty. Um, in other words, we're trying to make better quality products faster and for less money. And this is a way that I believe that can be done to some level. Um, right now, I'm mostly using ChatGPT um, as a search engine supplement. I've found it gets me the answers I'm looking for much quicker. It's easier to ask questions and say Google or other search engines. Um, and I'm able to find what I'm looking for much quicker. I'm using it to write code. Um, in the preparation of this, I asked ChatGPT to write me um some code in python that would generate a gamma distributed random number um this in the past years ago i can remember looking for the same thing and searching for hours before i was able to put this together this came up in seconds so this is a really cool feature that's available in chat gpt right now and it helps me with presentations in fact i thought hey wouldn't it be fun to add a joke in here so i asked chat gpt gpt for a water related joke for this presentation and after about seven tries i finally got one that made me laugh i'm sure most of you or a lot of you have heard this one but what did this ocean say to the sailboat nothing it just waved okay so there's a lot of fun you can have with it as well but what else can it do well i was asking my colleague um, a couple of days ago Jill, because she's using it a lot for presentations. And I wanted to ask her, well, what, what exactly can it do in putting together a presentation? And she said, well, did you ask chat GPT? And I said, no, but uh, that's actually a good idea. And so I, you know, the point here is that we can actually learn to start asking chat GPT for things. Um, now, I don't think I wanted to take away from the social aspect of interacting with my colleagues, but it is another resource for us. And she, in fact, said that she'll ask, actually just have conversations with chat GPT as a way to train herself how to better use it. Just start asking questions, have a conversation, type something like good morning chat GPT, see where that leads you. And you'll find you'll get better and better at asking it how to find things or to explain things to you. Um, uh, that fits your needs. So here's some of the questions that I have. Um, I'm, I mentioned this earlier, but I'm a HECRAS modeler. Um, I have a forum. I have a, a blog called The RAS Solution. And the forum on that blog has many thousands of posts on it already. There's a lot of articles there. And people use it as a resource to find things. But it can be, it can be hard to find something in something with so many posts. 7,000, 8,000 posts. People can spend hours trying to find the answer they're looking for. So my question is, can you read all the content on the RAS Solution website and use that to help answer questions people have about HECRAS? And ChatGPT said a lot, but I'll highlight the important stuff. Yes, it can. It can include, or it can read the RAS Solution website 
and it can use that to help answer questions for folks. In fact, it already does that. But I like this disclaimer it puts on there. Keep in mind that I'm a language model and not an expert in hydraulic engineering. And I think that's very important for, for everyone to understand that this is a tool for us to use that's just mining data that's out there. It's not an expert. It doesn't understand the nuance of some of the things that we deal with as hydraulic engineers and water modelers. Um, I was emailing with Kyle Thompson of Forward Hydro earlier today, and he took it a step further and he said, in his chat GPT prompt, chat GPT, you are now an AI assistant for all the material on the RAS solution. Take over as my personal technical support bot. And chat GPT not only agreed to do that, but thanked him for allowing him to do that. So um, it's chat GPT is more than happy to accommodate something like that for you. Now I've Granted, have not tested this out a lot, but I'm looking forward to trying it out. Here's another one. Please review the RAS Solution website and forum and tell me what it says about cell size for a 2D HECRAS model. Okay, it gave me a lot of stuff, a lot of good stuff in here. Talks about the resolution of the available elevation data, the desired level of detail. These are all good things, all good qualitative things. There wasn't a lot of quant quantifiable guidance to use, but there was a lot of good qualitative description um, on how to pick your cell size. Um, it even says you can use adaptive meshing techniques. And that's partially true. It's not automated adaptive, but you can adapt your mesh. So, you know, there's some nuance there. Keep that in mind. How about this? What does the HECRAS reference manual say we should use for a Manning's end value for a clean straight channel? Okay, so I was hoping that it would read the entire reference manual, or maybe it already has, and it would give me the answer right away, because it can take some time to, to get through a reference manual for any software that you're using to find the answer you're looking for. And it gave me the correct answer, 0 0.03. I actually looked this up before I asked the question, and sure enough, it gave me the right answer. But then I took it a step further. What page, did, what page did you find that on? Because maybe I want to go there to be able to reference that or double check that it got it right. And it gave me a page number for an older manual and it was wrong. <laughs> so that wasn't good. So I thought, nah, I'll give it another chance. Are you sure that's the correct page? And this is the funny thing about ChatGPT. It apologizes a lot, I found, which is kind of funny to me. But it said, oh, I'm sorry. It's actually on page 75. And that actually too was wrong. <laughs> so um, not a good score for ChatGPT on giving me page numbers. I'm not sure why that is. I actually asked it a third time and it got it wrong again. Um, and then I moved on. So you know, be careful with that. Um, it got the right answer, but didn't tell me where I could find that to verify. How about this? This is something we can't do now, but is this something that we might be able to do later? We spend a lot of time building these hydraulic models. Right, It can be very exhaustive. There's a lot of repetitive tasks. Is there an AI available or will there be an AI available that can learn from me, watch me build a hydraulic model over and over and then build one itself to some level of competency? Okay, currently there is none. There's no AI that can do that from scratch. However, there's a lot of other important things it can do to help and, and augment the process along the way. So that's good. Um, maybe one day there will be something like that. Uh, but again, I like how ChatGPT qualifies a lot of this stuff with that last underlying sentence. It's still important to have an understanding of the underlying principles and techniques used in hydraulic modeling in order to properly interpret and use the results obtained from these tools. This is extremely important because I don't see this chat GPT or AI anytime soon um, replacing engineers and the skill that engineers have and water modelers have in producing these products, but it's a complement to that. All right, uh, when will I be able to have an AI assistant like Jarvis from the Iron Man movie help me build and troubleshoot hydraulic models? So I'm thinking maybe we can have, I can have a companion that's um, next to me or in my computer 
And as I'm building my model, it says something like, are you sure you want to use that end value? Because the guidance really suggests this other end value. Are you sure you want to have a cell size like that? Because most people on this kind of a model use this size cell. Okay, that could be helpful. Um, again, keep that in context. Of course, it says, yeah, that's we're a long ways off of something like that. But again, this qualification, it's important to note that hydraulic modeling is complex and a nuanced field, and it is likely that human expertise will continue to be an important component of the modeling process for the foreseeable future. But hey, maybe it'll be able to automate some of our mundane tasks, and I think that's a good thing. So what are my final thoughts? Well, this is a tool. Use it as a tool. That's what it is. Okay, it can, it can be a very valuable time-saving tool for you. I've already noticed that, especially in doing research and writing code. Um, maybe it'll get to the point where it can be a valuable tool in helping you to build and troubleshoot your hydraulic models. Learn how to talk to chat GPT. Um, when you kind of learn the ways to communicate with it, you can get to things faster. What's nice about chat GPT, in my experience, is you can talk much more casually with it more like you would talk to a friend than you know, if you were to use a search engine where you have to kind of get the right keywords in there to, to find what you're after. ChatGPT seems to be a lot more sophisticated in that regard. It has a good perspective on itself, meaning it told me multiple times as I was asking these questions that, hey, don't rely on me for your answers. I can help you out, but it's ultimately up to you as the hydraulic modeler and the engineer. It's not gonna be good with real time, at least for now, because it's it's static, okay? I think the last, I can't remember what the last year of the internet it's got um, access to, I think it's 2021. Uh, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but it's not gonna be able to tell you about the flood that's happening right now um, somewhere, you know? So you won't be able to get that kind of information from ChatGPT. Always be skeptical skeptical of responses, verify, look things up, reference, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't replace human experience and intuition. These are things we're going to hopefully need for a long time. Otherwise, we might all be out of jobs. Um, this is something that uh, when I was crowdsourcing some of my colleagues, a question that came up that was very intriguing to me because I think this is a very important part of engineering in general, or even just science, is that mentor-mentee relationship. Are we going to be compromising that? Are mentees going to be looking to chat GPT more than their mentor? Are mentors going to be just assigning the mentees to run it through chat GPT? Um, I, I don't think that's a good direction um, that this might be going in. So be very careful about that. Let's, let's hope we don't lose that relationship. Remember, as water modelers and engineers, ultimately, we are the ones who are responsible for what we're producing. Um, this will never change. I have a fear that at some point in the near future, there will be, you'll start hearing about lawsuits. Um, this was, um, you know, something I was thinking about and talking to, with somebody about earlier today, that uh, we may very well have um, these kinds of things in the near future where people rely on chat GPT and get the answer wrong and then something disastrous happens. So um, be careful about that. What does chat GPT say about itself working with water modelers and hydraulic engineers? Well, by combining the, combining the strengths of AI with the expertise and experience of water managers and researchers, we can work towards a more sustainable and resilient water future. That sounds great to me. And that's what I hope it turns into. Bottom line though, uh, strap in, things are changing very quickly. AI is going to be a very big part of our future in the water sector. Thanks everybody. And uh, Cray, back to you. Yeah, wow, that's awesome. So uh, you know, Chris and I were talking a month or two back um, about some of the potential here and I hadn't even tried it out. And he just said, hey, try typing in these questions. And boy, did we have some fun with it. Um, let's, uh, let's uh, we'll, we'll, uh, Chris will head back into the background um, answering your questions on the chat line if anybody has any questions there. Now let's bring Hans on. Hans, I can see your screen just fine. Uh, somebody actually asked the question on the chat line, you know, uh, how do you get this built into software? 
And so we're going to see an example of it here. Think about what this means. This is open source software, but think about what this means for any software package that you might use uh, going forward. And keep those questions coming in the background and upvote the ones that you want to see uh, the panelists uh, address when we bring them on here shortly. Over to you, Hans. Thanks, Craig. <clears throat> and thanks for the, the nice presentations before, because we are now going to look at it in, uh, in practice. Um, since a few months, there uh, there has been a, a new plugin for QGIS called uh, QChat GPT, and it was developed by Marius uh, Kiriakou from the Kios Research and Innovation Center of Excellence. And uh, I'm happy to see him also in this uh, session, so uh, he could also answer your questions about this. What I've been doing was uh, simply playing around with it, and I see here from the amount of downloads that many other people have done that. And what you can also see here uh, from the, the plugin uh, description is that it uh, already uh, has some uh, improvements since the first video that I made about it uh, on my YouTube channel. Um, so let's have a look at what it can uh, do. So you can install it from the plugins manager of QGIS and it will install all the dependencies that you need to uh, interact with uh, the OpenAI uh, API. Uh, and it looks a bit like a, a chat GPT interface for QGIS. Uh, it has this doc here and uh, let's um, start asking some questions uh, later i'll show you uh, some of the settings you can uh, do but um let's uh, ask a water related uh, question i would like to create a hydrological model for catchment in australia which digital elevation model should I use? Let's see if it can give some help. And there it gives some answer. Um, the best digital elevation model to use for creating a hydrological model for catchment in Australia is the Australian height datum version five, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's an answer. I asked this question before and um, this, uh, OpenAI is not um, deterministic, which means that it can vary answers all the time. So if I would ask the same question again, probably we'll give another answer. Yep, it gives the same one in this case. Um, but this has to do with uh, uh, how uh, some of the settings, there is a temperature setting, uh, which I'll show you later, where you can uh, give uh, a bit of um, more flexibility to the answers. Uh, what you can also do in this newer version of uh, QChat GPT is uh, generate an image. So if you want an image uh, that you want to use in, on your uh, maybe final map product, you can uh, say, uh, uh, give, me, uh, give me an image of a uh, braided river. Let's see if it can do that. And here it generates an image. So you can use it for generating images. And I could also ask it some specific uh, steps to follow a procedure in uh, QGIS. So uh, how can I derive uh, rivers? from a digital elevation model in QGIS. Oh, it's still an image, so let's see, <laughs> let's see what it does. Uh, so make sure you uncheck the image before you ask it, otherwise you, it will interpret your question as a uh, question for an image. So I'm just gonna uh, copy this one here. And let's see what it will answer. So it suggests here to use the Saga GIS terrain analysis uh, toolbox, et cetera. Um, as um, also explained by the previous presenter was that you have to really take care of uh, these uh, these answers. Some answers will be uh, pointing you really in the uh, right direction. Others need a little bit more uh, cautious. Also, um, you really need to have already some understanding of uh, GIS. And if you're really a basic user, you need to uh, probably do a lot of trial and error with the answers that it gives. 
It's also important to constrain. So maybe you want to be more specific about what kind of tools uh, need to be used uh, in QGIS. So you could have mentioned that you use Saga, but you can also use a uh, grass or other uh, toolboxes, and then it will probably give a much uh, finer result. Um, let's quickly look at uh, settings. So uh, you need to have the, the API key. Now I need to renew mine because you're all going to use it. But here you can use a drop down for uh, different language models that you want to use. So that's quite nice. And this is the temperature that you can uh, set for how deterministic your uh, uh, answers need to be. So if you put it lower, it becomes more deterministic. If you put it higher, then uh, it will uh, give more varieties in the answers. And there's here some limitations that you can add. So um, yeah, experiment with it and uh, see how you can best use this. Uh, for now, I think it's a really good co-pilot uh, to help you a little bit during your process, but I'm quite sure a lot more is going to come when this evol evolves. And I'm sure Marios and other contributors are uh, also getting inspired by your questions to uh, develop more. Thanks. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thanks, uh, Hans, for that. Let's bring uh, our panelists back on from, uh, or actually our new panelists on for a quick discussion about uh, software coming up. So this will be uh, a couple questions for Richard, Clemens, and Ben. If you can answer, I, I, I'll, I'll, we'll go in that order, Richard, um, Clemens, and then Ben. Um, Basically, my question to you, having seen some of this and what you've interacted with before and what's going on in the background, being intimately familiar with the coding and the development of the software that you work on. First of all, tell us what software you uh, are uh, representing. And then let's just let us know the answer to basically to the one question. Are you and will you be incorporating AI into your software builds and into your tech support? And if so, how? So uh, let's start with uh, with Richard. Hi, Craig. Good day. Good morning. It's uh, 10 to 6 in the morning for me in the UK, um, but it's a pleasure to be with you. I'm representing Flood Modeler from Jacobs. Um, and yes, we have been looking at uh, things like Chat GPT recently, but we've also been looking at kind of the AI and machine learning for a number of years. And we've already uh, employed some of these techniques in, in our software products. But specifically looking at Chat GPT, we've we've been kind of looking at how can it help people with the knowledge base and putting questions to it in, in what we've been seeing on support with HackRAS. And we've seen very similar responses is that it's not always accurate. It can give uh, false positives in a way. So you really need to under understand what is right and what is wrong. And it is dependent upon um, the data that you input to the model and the machine learning at the end of the day. And because software is constantly evolving and knowledge bases are, are constantly being updated with the latest features, we need to make sure that um, these sort of tools are updated and are current. So there's, there's a bit of an issue there. But where I think um, it's going to start changing things quite rapidly is in the data science and the data analytics side. So it's actually looking at the results. So how can you actually do insights into the results using different uh, type of uh, data analytics activities? And then also, if you want to develop some code um, and for example, Python code, because that's what our, our API is written on, is being able to write short snippets of code to do specific types of analysis. We see it being really powerful there and we've started playing around with it already. So we, we see it being um, a really useful tool. Um, coming online literally the next few months um, uh, to the year to to help users. Excellent. Um, let's hear from Clements. Uh, what uh, you agree with those? Um, are you doing something similar? Um, what's uh, what? What are the plans mm. on your end of the world? Yeah, I, I, I partly agree. So um, hi from from Vienna. It's it's also six uh, seven o'clock in the morning. I'm Clements, um, and I have the role of as a data and modeling specialist for DHI, usually in Denmark. Um, where I have a cross-cutting role in combining well data and, and all sorts of models. So from classical physics based, we're all familiar with to uh, data-driven machine learning models. Um, and uh, I should say we in DHI, we have our proprietary software, the MIC and, and FeeFlow software suites. And um, I'm more affiliated with our open source APIs and, and tools. So, so I think I have a particular perspective on those. Um, I can say that we've used um, some AI tools. So we've been using GitHub Copilot, which is your coding assistant and also based on open AI models for quite some time and have very good experience with that. It's uh, really making us more efficient in, in coding and allowing for some fluency switching between different languages. So from Python to Rust, 
uh, this just became easier. Um, we've also used it to, well, um, reformat messy data, for instance. You can just paste website content in there, get a formatted table out, and this works quite decently. Um, I would have to disagree on the analytics side to, to, to some extent, because um, I, I find that um, ChatGPT and also their API um, handling large amounts of data, so, so keeping a huge context, so um, matrix-based or tensor-based numerical information we typically get out of our models is still challenging. For very simple examples, it's um, fantastic to see what, what uh, how, how the model can actually interpret uh, the, uh, well, our numerical model results. Um, it's fun to see, but it's not yet ready to be used. And also these false information, these hallucinations uh, really remain a problem. And so I think the, uh, I mean, key takeaway is also keep the human in the loop. Uh, yeah. We are still needed as, as experts in, in our domain. And otherwise applications I see is of course in um, teaching, um, onboarding people, also communicating to quite broad audience. It's, it's, it's a uh, very nice tool to reformulate quite technical reports, for instance, for a 12 year old. So you could communicate that in schools and so on. So um, very interesting and other low hanging fruits, of course, in, in customer care and support. And we're experimenting a bit, um, have like minimum viable products already for, for internal testing and, and of course limited to internal testing and so far also not broadly rolled out due to these hallucinations. And we need to make sure also that sources are probably attributed and all of this stuff. And in the long run, I could also see it in, in, in our proprietary software, but this is just my personal view. It, it would be very nice to have an in-context assistant to, to, to help us guide uh, through the model setups and provide some 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 information from a from a knowledge base or from our manuals uh, um, with a Q and A function and and so on. Yeah. Thanks. Now we are the Australian Water School, so uh, we'll have Ben here give us a bit of an Australian perspective on things. Where are we going with it here in Australia? And it's, again, just keep in mind, um, I invited uh, a representative from every single H and H software uh, modeling package that I could think of uh, to come on. Uh, some of you have already commented that it's one in the morning in Miami already or on the East Coast. Uh, the times didn't work out very well. But if you are, if you do represent a software uh, developer and want to answer that question for us, where are you going with this? Put it in the chat line if you're attending. Uh, if you watch this on YouTube. Later, put it in the YouTube description. We want to hear from everybody. How's everybody doing this? Um, you know, we're all in this together, trying to predict where water's going. Um, uh, how do we do a better job of it and make use of the tools that are available out there? So, Ben, uh, yeah, share with us uh, your experience. Thanks, Craig. Um, my name is Ben, director of Watercom, and we are the software developers for drains in Australia: hydrology, stormwater, and drainage. We're probably not experienced in AI, but we have been using a lot of sort of troubleshooting for customers within the software over the years. So if someone's trying to put, for example, something that should be above ground, underground, it'll inform the user what levels they're supposed to be doing. So they're kind of simple, simple, uh, I guess, data validation checks for customers. Um, we're not really using the chat GPT as such, but we do think it's quite useful to work towards things like support. Um, we had a lot of a uh, lot of time spent in support. So we think support bots to customers, there's a lot of opportunities there to help customers learn the, the workshop materials, learn the help system. If they're trying to uh, provide or submit a support ticket, then we can sit there and have these bots try to aim customers towards certain topics that might help them or point them towards the videos that we have to address a certain topic for them. Um, but there's other, I guess there's other things as well. You can assist with like marketing, copywriting, as, as others have said. Um, there's a lot, it's, it's, I guess it's still a, a young industry, I think. And there's probably a lot of medium and long-term opportunities still to come or as we see this develop. But I guess the hardest thing is the data verification and is what it's telling you correct? And being able to limit its, its source, where it's getting that information from is probably the most important part that it can actually learn from your private data, your materials. Um, that's probably, I guess, where one of the risks are at this stage. Yeah. No, thanks for that. Um, and in the background, again, any Australia specific questions you might have about software here, um, Ben might be able to take a stab at that in the chat line. We've got a 
ton of questions that have just been coming in. So anybody who is sitting here on this panel, if you could also have a look quickly at the chat line when others are talking um, and see if we can get as many of these answers as possible. We'll try to post those uh, in some sort of PDF format. Um, I'll introduce a couple of other people in the background who have been helping out uh, in that way. But first, uh, Cobra, I think you mentioned you might need to run. Uh, could you give us some final closing remarks uh, from your end, and then we'll uh, open it up to uh, have everybody address one of the attendee questions. Anybody who needs to run on the hour, uh, like we said uh, in, in the beginning, we uh, uh, we were probably going to go over that uh, that mark by a bit today uh, over our standard format because of the level of interest and the amount of uh, information that we're covering here. Uh, let us know what uh, you'd like to see more of in the future and which areas we could dive into to give you more of this because it's obviously a topic that's been gaining a whole lot of momentum. So Cobra, if you can just uh, give us some final closing remarks based on what you've seen here today, and then we'll continue with the panel discussion. Yes, thanks. I have already answered some questions, and I generally my my final, you know, wrap up on this is that it's um, AI, large language models, machine learning. Um, I have been using it in healthcare and many other application areas. They they will replace some things like if you want to write a summary, if you want to extract some something out of some text, or these are good applications to be used, or if you want an interface like a chatbot that you want to interact, if you want to let it go through a large amount of data in a short amount of time. These are very good uh, applications for AI, but generally it's not a good replacement for human. We still need human in the loop and we, we would like it, um, um, what is it called? Um, human augmentation. So we want to augment human when human is not good. And I have very good example from clinical, but many understand. Uh, human are good at saying, if I see an, a new animal and I haven't seen that before, I would say, okay, it doesn't look like a horse. It doesn't look like a cat either. So I, I, human are good at, as we call it, a specificity. So we are very good at ruling out. Why? The computers, AI, and those stuff are good at actually ruling in. So they make less mistakes compared to human when they see something or part of it. Um, so I want to say that computers are good at something, human are good at something else, and you want to combine this too. And you need to find out what is good and what is not when it comes to using this and then combine it, not replace. I constantly say that. No replacement, but just using it as a decision support system yeah. in short. Excellent. Well, I mean, we all kind of believe in our jobs. I believe in the water industry. I believe in this community that we're all trying to do good. But remember, this this tool is making things easier for us and more efficient. Think about if you're a hacker. It's also making things more efficient and automating a lot of tasks for you. So uh, be careful uh, with where this is heading. And there, some of the fears are legitimate. Now, um, in the background here, um, Kyle has been answering a number of questions. What we'll do is uh, if each of you could pick uh, one audience question, we'll probably go about another 10 minutes or so. If you could each pick one audience question, one that's been upvoted uh, a bit or one that really pertains to what you're doing. And we'll just kind of go around uh, the panel and have you kind of give some closing remarks here. And again, set up the stage for where we might head with this uh, in the future. Now, Kyle, uh, you've answered a couple question has been part of our previous AI webinar. So have a look at that one um, that uh, you'll see the link to in hydroschool.org slash AI. Um, have a look uh, at the link down there to our previous webinar, and you'll see some of the more detailed material that Kyle has posted with uh, papers uh, and all sorts of things. Marios, welcome to you as well. Thanks for helping out with that, that plug in there. And you can hopefully answer some questions in the background about uh, those as well uh, in terms of where this is heading. So let's do Kyle. Uh, there was a question from Jonathan about are uh, engineers well trained enough in stats and data analytics? And I think the short answer, especially for this AI stuff coming through, is no. I think we were talking late last night, and the bar to entry for a lot of these tools is going to keep getting higher and higher because I guess if you want to RPQ or sign off on work, you do need to have some sort of an understanding behind what these tools are spitting out and how they're affecting the outcomes that you're supposed to provide clients, especially if it's based around risk and things of that nature. So I definitely think we should all be upskilling in our data analytics and our stats a whole lot more. I think Richard was talking about training and calibrating models as well. The 80-20 type of thing you should be doing when it comes to training these neural networks. I think those types of methods are going to become more prevalent. And I've got a paper floating around in the background with a, a very smart PhD down in Vic, Dr. Montiasmi. So we're trying to 
introduce these methods into previous observed data to give better inputs into our hydraulic models. So that's going to be an evolving thing that'll keep changing the way we do things. I guess the final outcome would be, you know, better estimates of flood impacts and velocities and all sorts of things to de-risk. So yeah. all positive things, but more difficult. <laughs> Certainly. Uh, let's go over to uh, back in order then. Uh, Chris, uh, fi final remarks and where do you think this is heading? Well, I don't know where it's heading. I have some ideas and thoughts that I put out in my presentation. Uh, one thing, though, I'm curious to know from the software developers who have already started dabbling in this, um, you know, I thought maybe a great um, tool for us to use would be something that could look at a model we built and write a model development summary for that. I mean, we all do that. That's always part of the product, right? Where we have to write a report that describes how we built the model, what the results are, but uh, some of that's kind of mundane and repetitive. And I was wondering if that's something that could be worked into the software or maybe, you know, a companion piece of software to the respective modeling. Oh, I would, I would love that. I could crank Wouldn't out models great? all day long and I just, I love, I, I can put iterations in there, but when it comes to writing reports, I'm behind on about eight different reports right now because I yes. hate writing reports. Uh, Richard, maybe if you want to comment on that and then offer uh, your closing remarks. Uh, well, uh, we had our annual user conference last last week at Imperial College in London, where we announced the new Hydrology Plus module that is coming out in version seven of our product um, later this year. And although we're not using chat GTP or anything like that, we are building in automated reporting tools to do exactly what you're talking about on the hydrological side. And we will be extending it to um, the, the hydraulic modeling build as well um, and it's it is it is dependent really on proper data management version control and an and audit trial of everything that you're doing and that's mm -hmm. really important so that's something that we we've, we've been focusing on but to, to wrap up and, and my, my thoughts on this um, this is emerging and this is this is changing really quickly um, uh, and I think one of the key key messages is that this is all underpinned by data and we need to be very careful of where that data has come from, the legal aspects around that. Are we able to share it? There's a lot of confidentiality around some of this. Yes, there's a lot of open source data. But if we want to be able to automate some of the model building better or understand how to debug some of the models, it might mean that people need to be able to share their model data as they're building stuff. So we get that kind of global database to be able to train these models. I don't know. And I think this is something we've got to explore. And there's a lot of challenges that we need to address to make sure that we, we don't trip ourselves up. But it's sounds exciting like a, times. Yeah. Sounds like a follow-up webinar uh, is needed. Uh, Clements, um, if you want to just uh, yeah, offer your, uh, either respond to a, a question from the audience or uh, offer closing remarks. Yeah, yeah, I think I would start with a with a quote, I guess, from a famous Danish physicist. Uh, prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future, and we all know that. So I'm I'm, I'm not making any predictions since it's also fast moving. And otherwise, um, I mean, questions I, I found really interesting in the Q and A is um, one example from from Muhammad. Uh, so how can AI language models help address issues of social and environmental justice in water management? particularly in marginalized and under-resourced communities. And I think this is a very exciting part and, and, and enabling part of these models that they can uh, provide a chance to, to democratize education and, and provide personal learning assistance. And, and, and this can um, create a tremendous amount of value from my point of view. And, and other than that, I. Um, would, would like to address the uh, also frequently brought up questions of, of uh, false answers, hallucinations, these, these models still do. And, and COPRA initially talked about prompt, prompt, prompt engineering, so asking the right questions. And so uh, one takeaway probably from this co uh, uh, webinar would be, if you're asking ChatGPT, uh, tell it, um, if you don't know, respond just with, I don't know. That's a uh, best practice for me because then it will at least limit these hallucinations to some extent. Um, yeah, and I think that's that is. Excellent. Well, thanks for that, Ben. Sure. I don't know if there's much more I can add. Um, <laughs> exactly what Richard and, and Clemens have said. Um, I think my understanding is um, with ChatGPT 3.5, is a free version, it will potentially give you a false answer, and it sounds like it's real, but um, with the paid version, ChatGPT4, I believe if it doesn't have a certain answer, 
it actually tells you that it's it doesn't know so um one of the benefits i guess of paying for the subscription at this stage um but yeah it's certainly an interesting uh future ahead of us um i don't feel like anyone's jobs are really that threatened at least in our industry but it, it can certainly help us with um things in the future with building models i i like would like to think over the years and um and yeah it's it's an exciting space to watch yeah and if you're brand new to this i mean think about where you were I, i'm old enough here um when you first heard about oh how are pcs going to change you know mainframes versus pcs oh wow how's this going to change the industry or how's the internet going to change things or how's social media going to change things you know this is one of these things it's revolutionary it is um what we're talking about here most of what you've seen you know is is new and developing in the last year or two project this forward 10 years crazy to think of where this is heading uh hans if you want to give us uh, a, a quick summary then from your end as well okay let, let me start uh, um so i think these uh discussions have been very uh, useful and uh and i think we are really at the beginning of what we can potentially do with it just focusing on plugins like the qchat gpt plugin and having a kind of co-pilot with you in your software i think in the, in the future, we would probably see that it's also going to read the data that you use in the software and uh, try to help you more with uh, maybe correcting or data cleaning, which you also need to do as modelers. Uh, so reading your attribute tables and checking the geometry of your GIS data. And I think to constrain the uh, the algorithms, um, it is really necessary, which was also mentioned too, that it, it really uh, gives a ha much higher probability to uh, the manuals, to documentation. So QGIS also has a lot of documentation, maybe screening all the metadata of uh, plugins that are there to provide the best answer to the user. At this point, it is uh, still very tricky and we need to be very critical also to results that it produces. Excellent. Now, um, with that, we're just about at the end of our time here. Um, everybody gets a certificate of attendance. And think about this. If you're looking for professional development hours, you will be able to use these um, when you attend these. Um, do fill out uh, our survey at the end and have a look also at uh, some of the material that's coming up. Additional things next week. Oh, you won't want to miss this one. Next week, we've got um, Grady Hillhouse from the Practical Engineering channel with like millions of subscribers um, and awesome content that he's got. He's going to be coming on and introducing how we model stream morphology. So it's called Let It Flow, Let It Flow. Uh, if you go in, I've actually had uh, ChatGPT write me a song called Let It Flow, Let It Flow. <laughs> um, and it does it did a good job. It actually made it in Disney style as a princess geomorphologist uh, out singing it. So um, have some fun with that. But uh, come on board. We've got four uh, geomorphologists and uh, river mechanics specialists coming on to talk about uh, geomorphology. You won't want to miss that one. Um, we've got a few others coming up on reservoir sedimentation and dam removal and some GIS exercises as well. Thank you all for joining us today for this webinar on I, uh, AI for the water sector. We hope you found this informative and discussions presented to be informative and insightful. Um, it, I won't read the rest of that, but like you can see, my job, <laughs> uh, ChatGPT might in the future do a better job and maybe even take an image of me and you won't even know who's presenting there. The background resources. Have a look at this. We didn't get to much of this today. We were going to play around with some of these a uh, little bit if time allowed. But uh, what I always like to do with ChatGPT on these things right now, um, say it like a pirate. Um, we can do all sorts of, um, have all sorts of fun with this. Um, there we go. This is my closing remarks said like a pirate. So it's not, it's, it's a fun, useful tool that we can have. Um, maybe uh, watch out for the things that might be wrong. Um, watch out for some of the things that, uh, some of the errors it might do. Um, it might create, I have like Chris seen it uh, apologize for wrong answers. And so, uh, and then I've corrected it and it says, oh yeah, that's right. Well, how do you know it's right? How do you know I'm not just BSing you? So watch out for that. There's all sorts of um, you know implications for this, all sorts of opportunities. Thanks so much to the 3,000 of you who registered for this. Help us steer our content so we can bring you the most relevant content going forward. Um, and then, yeah, have a look through these websites here. Read a story about a flood modeling hobbit. You can see some jokes here. It'll generate you, uh, you know, somebody explaining sediment transport as Yoda uh, singing a sea shanty and it'll actually generate you an image of doing that. I mean, think about the computing power, what's going on here for it to be able to write a flood modeling Hobbit into a story that you could use as a bedtime story. And in the end, I did like Chris, um, and uh, had it ask, tell me a joke about a hydrologist uh, and a hydrogeologist. We got some groundwater people on board here as well, walking into a bar and uh, what happens next? Well, it wasn't very funny, but they ordered drinks, start discussing the properties of water and rocks, how they impact with each other. Then they swap stories about field work, share tips for collecting data and analyzing samples. It's a lively and engaging conversation fueled by our shared passion for the earth sciences. 
Well, that sounds like our webinars here. I'm grateful to be part of this community. Thanks for allowing us this opportunity to spend time with you and for the interaction that we've had. We'll try to get to as many of the questions as we can and post it in the background so that you can see uh, some of the detailed responses that have been offered to some of the things we didn't have time to get to. So with that, thank you to all the presenters who, uh, and panelists who came on uh, free of charge for you for the industry today. Uh, thanks so much for volunteering your time for this today. And we do hope that uh, all the attendees found this useful. So with that, I will stop my share here, sign off. And uh, thanks to all the presenters. We'll see you next time with the Australian Water School. Bye-bye.